Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Really happy to have you here. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you, but before we get into those, why don't we start easy? Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do at Autodesk? So thanks, Kelly. Uh, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Logan Foster. I'm one of the product owners here at Autodesk, and I work in the modeling capabilities. So what that means by modeling capability is I get to work on Maya and 3ds Max, uh, doing all the really cool um, modeling stuff. So polygon modeling, spline modeling, modifiers, nodes, uh, you know, retopology workflows, UV workflows, all the stuff that like kind of leads to content creation, that, that initial early stage stuff that's so critical in part to every 3D production that's out there. So as someone who comes from the industry, are there any challenges that maybe game studios are facing today that you might have not encountered back in your days? I think there's a lot of challenges. So while, you know, people can think about games being similar, you know, like they, they maybe haven't changed. I think they've changed a lot in, in a very different subtle way. So when we think about content creation, there's this constant march to create new content that's out there. Um, you know, so games are, you know, they still take a long time to make, but now we're spending a ton of time making content for people to enjoy, right? Our, our customers are wanting to see more and more work. They want to see, you know, they want to get more than 20 hours of enjoyment sometimes. They want to get 40 hours, 80 hours, 120 hours with the game content now out of there with uh, variable like endings and playthroughs and all sorts of really cool fun stuff like that that you know we as, as gamers really enjoy and love to play uh, but it puts a lot of stress on the content creation teams because it's just more to get through more to get done right as someone who's focused in modeling capabilities for 3ds max and maya can you give us any examples of workflows that would benefit artists at game studios today certainly yeah there's been a lot of focus on these types of workflows uh, and really one of the things we've been trying to focus on is is proceduralism and, and parametric design and stuff that's art directable and so what I mean by that is is tools that are interactable not only in the viewport for like the artist to enjoy so we think about things like smart Street that we put out which is you know a very cool um, you know manifold cutting tool that kind of just lets you do these awesome interactive like modeling edits inside the software uh, but also thinking about things like array and booleans and and content like that which really allows people to interactively create and modify and customize right you know there's been tons of times as an artist at a studio you know i've been working on something and then the art director's like oh that's really cool but can you can you just do this one little change right here but knowing that we've been addressing these things though that type of workflow so it's procedural parametric and you say yeah sure not a problem i'll just tweak you adjust it you, you know you, you can work with your art director to to get that result that you want art content creation should be should be fun it's enjoyable right it's all it's why we got into making art content to begin with and why we wanted to use digital content creation tools right it's mm -hmm. it's all about that that enjoyment and we want to make certain that we're bringing that enjoyment back into the software so it's accessible it's fun it's easy to use it's it's interactable but it's also really reliable Awesome, that was a really good overview of modeling capabilities. But what about animation? What is Autodesk doing to help animators work in games, you know, not get bogged down by their tools? Yeah, that's great. And animation is is important, right? When you think about games, you know, we got really awesome 3D models for environments and characters and props and vehicles. And animation is what kind of brings it all to life, right? It, it gives that, that, that punch, that wow factor, that realism that you want to bring into it. And I think really thankful for, you know, for people working in the games industry, Autodesk has had a really awesome set of animation tools, be it Maya, which has been, you know, a huge standard for, for you know, compelling animations, especially for character animations and, and complex rigs and things like that. Uh, but we've also got things like Motion Builder, especially in the AAA industry, rely upon to do like all sorts of animation, not just, you know, characters and motion capture, but also things like how things land me, like a door opening or closing or, or things like that. Like there, there's some really cool stuff that people are doing. And then of course there's 3ds Max, which, you know, comes with some really awesome out of the box um, auto rigging tools. So cats and biped, for example, um, you know, two animation tools that are, you know, older, but incredibly you know, powerful, verbose, relied upon still by a lot of game studios to do a lot of amazing work. And uh, you know, that's, it's been one of those focuses of Autodesk is to make certain that our animation customers are you know, being serviced and, and, and having reliable results. And, and with that same credo that we went with for modeling, which is we want to make it so it's enjoyable, it's reliable, and the animator could just focus on making really good, compelling animations. Love that. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about open standards, which we know is still a topic that's widely discussed in the industry. How is Autodesk helping artists leverage open standards like OpenUSD today? 
Certainly, yeah. OpenUSD and OpenPBR are, are two really good examples of standards that are very, if not important today, are definitely becoming more and more important for, for games industry and games development. OpenUSD obviously is probably the more common one that I think people know about. It's, it's a really powerful interchange format which allows for you know, it's not just mesh data or animation data being moved in. It, it actually holds and contains a lot of very powerful information and references about uh, um, data sets and, and manipulation and, and referencing other data. So for game developers, you can almost think of it like a, like a really cool, really powerful like, level of your game being encompassed in a, in a file that your DCC like a Maya or 3DS Max can read and operate and use. Um, so it's, it's really powerful. It's got a lot of very interesting uh, abilities in it for these things called like variants. So variants are this ability to have, you know, instead of having 50 or 60 like different rocks in your scene and you're trying to pick like, okay, which rock am I going to use? You could actually just have like a rock and a rock can contain all these different variants in it. And then it's very easy for uh, the game engine to actually, you know, you could code it up in the game engine and just say, just randomly use a rock, right? Use rock, you know, zero through 60 and scatter them around and, and, and work with them. So those are things that are like super powerful for uh, for game developers that maybe in the past had to, you know, rely on multiple old like FBX files being imported in and having to manage that themselves. So there's, there's a lot of really cool abilities there. Uh, USD has things called layers built into it. So layers can be these non-destructive ideas. So it's, it's kind of like the idea of a variant or a variation to it, but you can build animation layers, for example, on top of existing animations, or you can do non-destructive camera edits and models and things like that. So, so we're seeing it being used quite a lot, not just for, you know, modeling and, and contents that, you know, visual 3D content that goes in. Certainly for animations, cinematic design for games is really big for uh, USD, being able to hold all these, these animation layers and these, these camera layers within it that they can use to uh, manipulate, put things in different locations and different changes without having to be very destructive on top of uh, content that's already been made for the game that, that they're just trying to reuse. And, and there's a lot of good support coming out for it that we're seeing in, you know, common everyday game engines that, that, you know, studios are relying upon forever. So it's safe to say that open standards like USD, very important. Very important, <laughs> yes. And then another open standard that's coming out is called OpenPBR. And then OpenPBR is a subset of the material X work that we've been doing here at Autodesk. Um, but OpenPBR is a standard that was announced through the Academy Software Foundation. So the idea is that we want to make a universal material shader based on the PBR specification, but one that can actually be transferred from you know, DCC to DCC or DCC to Game Engine to make the data just come across and work, right? If, if you're a, a game developer and you don't have a really good pipeline or say if you're an indie working with stuff and you're, you're exporting your content out from Maya or 3ds Max in the Game Engine, like I can tell you one of the most frustrating things is having to go in and reset your materials when you go and bring your content into the game engine and, and hook all that stuff up. And this is one of those things open PBR should be fixing for us as, as people that are either dabbling in games or actually working full time in games to help solve and make just a little bit easier, a little bit better and have that interchange so that the data is coming across one to one and you're not having to, you know, figure out special rules or write special scripts to get this information in there. So would you say that open standards would be beneficial mostly for AAA game studios or do you see benefits for, you know, smaller indie studios? I as think well? there's a benefit for everybody. Maybe indie studios and, and AA might even benefit more uh, with this than maybe AAA. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, these AA and indie studios don't necessarily have a lot of like tech artists and people on hand that can write custom scripts and, and get their pipelines going. They're relying very much more on what do they get out of the box with 3ds Max or Maya? Or what do they get out of the box with their game engine of choice that they're using? And, and so they're just trying to work with it and get their content created done. So having something like OpenUSD or OpenPBR just working right away, you know, those can be huge time savers, especially when you maybe only have an art team of five people, maybe it's even three people, or it's just yourself bringing that content in. You know, that, that savings in half hour, hour, two hours of bringing materials or content across, that's a game changer. Oh yeah, every yeah. second counts. Yes, exactly. So you spoke about game engines a little bit earlier, which we know are a huge part of creating a game. How are we at Autodesk connecting our tools to game engines? So aside from open standards, like OpenUSD, OpenPBR, uh, another initiative that we've done here at Autodesk is actually create something called LiveLink for, for the Unreal Game Engine provided by Epic. LiveLink is a really interesting tool that provides almost like a near one-to-one -one, uh, connection for animation data uh, between the Unreal Game Engine 
going back to Maya. So what this means is that a person can be working in the Unreal game engine, make changes, edits to the animation data there in, inside the animation tools, and that data can be streamed almost instantaneously over to Maya. The animator over in Maya, be it next door or you know the next table or hundreds of kilometers away, uh, can actually go and get this data, look at it, make their own manipulations, and then push it back very quickly back into the Unreal Engine. And this is all done without needing to do you know the the complex method of file export, you know, upload into Git or SVN and, and commit it that way. So it's a very instantaneous result that's, uh, that's very seamless, works really well for a lot of game studios, but also works for people that are using uh, game engines technologies for other means. So you know, we're seeing it for animation and film and television production as well. So it's, uh, it's a very cool production tool. Awesome. So tell me, how are we helping creators reduce friction in their workflows? We're helping creators reduce friction in their workflow in two ways. So the first way that we want to think about it is, is how do we help the studios? So how do we help the producers, the art directors, the art leads, all the production people involved in, in making the game that, that aren't necessarily maybe a, a modeler or an animator, right? So obviously we've got 3ds Max, we've got Maya, we've got Motion Builder. Those are all great tools for content creation. Um, you know, they're focused very much on trying to make artists be the most productive that we can make them within the tools themselves for content creation, getting them up to that that last 90% as quick as they can so they can focus on, on that fine detail and that fine work. We're known for that. We do that really well and, and we've done it really well for well over 25 years. But what's also important to remember is that we've got really good tools for production tracking. So we got Flow Production Tracking, formerly known as ShotGrid, and we've got Flow Capture, formerly known as Moxium. These are both really great tools for assisting the entire production team for understanding the content creation process, all the work that's being done, the state that it's in, where it is, when it's ready to be worked on, who's working on it, all these very important things that are critical, especially as we start talking about games productions that are, you know, not just indies, but, you know, double A and even triple A's that are going into the millions or tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of cost, right? There's, there's a lot of risk involved in potential, you know, content creation that gets done incorrectly. And this is what we're trying to solve with these tools.